Hello and welcome back to Tinker Talks Guns. This time we're going to talk about the Ruby Pistol, or rather pistols, which were a World War I era service pistol used initially by the French and later by quite a lot of European and some African nations. So before we get into that though, I'd like to thank my supporters on Patreon. All of this costs money and you help more than you know. If you'd like to join my supporters on Patreon, there is a link in the description below, and any contribution is much appreciated. I'd also like to thank individuals like Jake and Karen, who frequently loan me pistols, not just Jake and Karen, but others as well, to do reviews or videos about. So I appreciate you all, and again, you, you help make this all happen. So. The Ruby Pistol was developed in 1914 by Gabilondo y Arresti in Ivar, Spain, and it was a stout, pretty well-made 32 caliber or 7.65 millimeter uh, semi-automatic pistol based on the FN and Colt model 1903. They made a number of changes, which we'll talk about on the tabletop, but one of them that's significant included the use of a nine round magazine instead of the eight rounds of the FN and Colt. And mechanically, this is an internal hammer fired single action pistol. Very simple in concept, very easy to field strip. And, um, you know, aside from caliber, it was a reasonable prospect for a service pistol. And of course, at the beginning of World War I, the French were desperate for service pistols. I'm not sure why they're not terribly important militarily, but they wanted them. And they placed a huge order with Gabaline, Gabalondo e Oresti. Now, since initially this was for 30,000 pistols a month, that was a bit much for them. So they subcontracted four other of the more prominent gun makers to help them. And this eventually rose to 50,000 pistols a month. In total, 710,000 Ruby-style pistols were accepted by the French into service. And by 1920, 580,000 of them were still in service. It's not too bad, given that they went through a major world war. Um, the pistol remained in service with the French until 1958, when they were finally totally phased out. They also served with a number of European nations, and um, several African nations and others as well. So it was a it was pretty successful and ubiquitous service pistol, despite some interesting stuff that we'll get into later. Anyway, let's take a look at the Ruby. So the Ruby is not a large pistol, being about six, and a, six inches long and about four and a half inches high. The magazine is removed with a heel type magazine release. There is a manual safety here, and there is a magazine disconnect safety. The safety in this position allows the gun to be fired, and in this position, it's safe, in theory. So, operation is very simple. Load the pistol, remove the safety, and pull the trigger. The trigger pull is about I, I'm going to go with five and a half pounds or so. So it's not light, but it's not bad, especially for a service type pistol. And there is commendably little over travel and pretty crisp break. The sights are, as you would expect, awful. But that was pretty much standard for the time. So... To disassemble the gun, you pull the slide back and lock the safety in place on this one because of where I have to hold it in place. You can then rotate the barrel and slide the whole assembly off the front of the gun. You can see there is a guide rod with an uncaptured recoil spring and the barrel can be rotated back and removed for cleaning and maintenance and that's all there is to it. And this is particularly desirable in a military style pistol because there's nothing to lose that isn't fairly big, you know, big enough to be fairly easy to find. So 
So reinsert the barrel, rotate 180 degrees, make sure the recoil spring guide rod gets into the appropriate place in the frame, but you have to engage the rails first. And then, and of course it's going to be tricky because, right, because I'm doing a video and that's how that works. Okay, so push it back in. Oh, <laughs> and we've had an issue. Because, you know, doing a video, there's always going to be an issue. Lock the safety in place, push the barrel to the appropriate spot, and you can rotate it back, release the slide, and you're ready to go. Now, <clears throat> there were issues with the Ruby. And one of them was standardization, because in addition to the four companies making them under contract, uh, the French government was not satisfied with 50,000 pistols a month and independently contracted other companies in Ibar, Spain to make knockoffs of these pistols. And quality control was, let's call it highly variable. Some manufacturers used unsuitable metals or bad heat treat, and there were a fair number of issues. One of which was the magazines. Now, you can see there is a number here. Maybe you can't. It's pretty small and pretty weak. And that's supposed to be the last two serial numbers of the gun. It isn't. Because this is not the magazine that was originally provided with this pistol. And among the knockoffs, uh, magazines weren't always interchangeable between guns from the same company. So, magazines can be problematic. And you can see this one is uh, <laughs> what a curator would call badly perished. And that goes into this gun's story, which I'll tell after the tabletop. So, it is a simple robust gun. Um, the ones from Gabalondio, Gabalondo y Oresti were generally of pretty good quality, but you can see some very distinct machining marks on here. And as the contracts went on, an awful lot of the manufacturers, look at this, uh, were very blasé about the external finish on the guns as you can witness from all of the tool marks and things on this one. And uh, so the ones from Gabalondo, Gabalondo y Oresti and the original four contractors um, were generally pretty decent. And the ones from the others are, are a crapshoot. Uh, this one is labeled 7.65 Court 9 Coors Unique. I have no idea what that means or who made it. Uh, this one originally did, did not have grips when I got it. Uh, when I, and as a favor to Jake and Karen, I made these nice mango grips for it. Now, this, the standard grips do extend all the way to the bottom of the pistol. Um, so I got it wrong. And uh, there were no grip screws, and grip screws are unobtainium. So I substituted these uh, brass screws, which I adapted the gun by the simple expedient of forcing them into the threads and allowing the frame of the gun to cut the threads to the proper size. Uh, there's a bit of bodge gunsmithing for you, but it worked. Uh, this gun, when it came to me, had no finish all the way through here, back here, or on the slide. And as you can see, was missing some in other places. Uh, in the interest of conservation, with the owner's permission, uh, I applied some uh, Oxfo blue to it and cleaned up any obvious rust. But as you can see, it was in pretty rough condition, which is not surprising, given the circumstances it came from. It is a hefty gun, 
recoil is mild and it's really quite pleasant to shoot and despite the pathetic sights at five yards at least it's not at all hard to get good hits quickly on a silhouette so as i say a bit of a crap shoot but overall a solid gun now the story this gun came into the possession of jake and karen many years ago after uh Karen's father had passed away, and they were helping to arrange things for the estate sale. And so, um, there we go. And so, um, they were in the garage and moved an ancient paint can, and this fell off the shelf from between a couple of the ancient paint cans in the condition I specified. Um, there were no grips, so they could see that up to a point there were no rounds in the magazine, but they couldn't tell if there were rounds, there's room for a couple rounds inside the frame above the opening in the grip frame. And uh, they couldn't check because they could not remove the magazine or operate the slide. It was frozen solid. So Jake soaked it in uh, various solutions for various days and was eventually able to get the magazine out and verify that it was empty and there was no round in the chamber. And um, when I when I was handed this to make grips for and feature in a video, um, it had not been fired in, I'm going to guess, many, many decades. <laughs> and uh, and it doesn't have the correct magazine. So um, I did need to do a little fussing with it at the range, which took a pair of needle nose pliers in about five minutes. I had to make a small adjustment to the recoil spring, which tended to want to get in front of the guide rod, and tweak the magazine feed lips, after which it worked pretty well. It had one malfunction where it choked on my range ammunition because it's designed to work with ball ammo because that's all there was then. And uh, little did I know when I left for the range, what I had thrown in my uh, bag was hollow point ammunition. Now, the capacity of the magazine is nominally nine rounds. What I discovered was that if you try to force the nine round in, ninth round in, you can do it, but it will push the eighth round back far enough that it will rim lock on the cartridge below it which jams the gun up solid because it can't get the round out of the magazine. Now, what rimlock is, is owing to the fact that 32 ACP is a semi-rimmed cartridge. It will, in fact, slip right into 32 Smith & Wesson long revolvers and will eject properly because of that tiny little rim. And if you load the magazine correctly, these rims stack Hard to show this they're very small the rims will line up thusly with the top round having its rim in front of the round underneath and all is happy in the light but when you try to force in the ninth round into this particular magazine it pushes the eight round back so that the rim of this cartridge is in the extractor groove of the eighth cartridge and the gun stops working so Yes, you can put nine rounds in the magazine, but only put in eight if you want this one to work. I don't know that that's common in ruby pistols in general, but it's common in this one. And as I said, despite the piss poor sights and its unique provenance, the gun was quite nice to shoot and worked fine. And uh, the safety is a little hard for people with smaller hands than mine or shorter thumbs to actuate. But it's very easy for me, and unless your hands are very small, it'll probably be pretty easy to use. Now, of course, given the age and inherent uncertainties of these pistols, you'd be a fool to rely on it. Because even if it works initially, if it's one of the ones with heat-treated poorly heat treated parts or 
improper metals used in its construction, it's going to fail. Because the design is unlikely to fail catastrophically and injure you, it's just going to break and stop working, and parts will be dubious if you can find them because they may not fit your gun because these are different. Some of the knockoff manufacturers actually <laughs> used guns with a striker fired mechanism until instead of uh, the single action concealed hammer. And apparently the French didn't notice or didn't care because they were just in desperate straits. Anyway, they're a pistol with an interesting history and if you get a good one, it's a good pistol. It's not a modern pistol. It's not particularly useful in modern terms. But, you know, as a conversation piece, a bit of history and a range toy, they're fine. And um, they are commanding a price that I consider somewhat ridiculous, given their quality and the large numbers of them out there. Um, you know, usually between... $499 and $600. You can find them cheaper once in a while, and sometimes you can find them for the Eternal Optimus at Gun Broker at absolutely stupid money. It is what it is. Anyway, neat old gun, and this one has a neat story, so I like it. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please take five seconds out of your busy life to hit the like button. It really helps the channel. And if you want to see more videos like this and many other things, hit subscribe and notifications, which also helps the channel. Anyway, I hope this finds you well. Stay safe, take care, and we'll talk to you again real soon.